Um, picking up at where Dave kind of like led us into, just yesterday I had a fellow archivist go like, an MKA file, and he like, okay, how can I rewrap this? I'm like, cool, a Matroshka audio file. I know they're, like, they're technically a Matroshka file, but why do you have it? Where does it come from? And he's like, well, um, we were thinking about which audio preservation format, and I know it's broadcast wave and wave, but if Matroshka as a container fulfills all archival needs, including like conformance checking and everything, why not use this as a wrapper for audio? I mean, wouldn't this be legally good for preservation for audio as well? And I'm like, thanks a lot for this input, Christoph, because honestly, I was kind of mentally checked off the WAV file broadcast extension header for audio. But since yesterday, I'm thinking about reconsidering MKA as archival format for audio. That's just something, that, a coin that came into my machine yesterday. So I just share it with you so you can also tinker about this. Pros and cons of WAV versus Matroshka as a container. And I hope I got this mouse. Where am I? There we are. And this should go seamlessly into this presentation. What I'm going to talk about is insights of FF1 as a video codec and Matroshka as a container for audiovisual preservation. It's going to be a bit techy, but I myself can't dive into the math parts as deeply as I would love to, because I know some math, but I'm not a mathematician. So I'll be fine. There we go. Starting with FF3.1 as a video codec. I'm just setting here a timer, so I'm not going to overdo stuff. It's plain and simple. Those are the parameters that you can choose when you create an FF3.1 file. So the cool thing is it's a lossless codec. So whatever you do wrong, you can't do it wrong. In terms of like people ask me, oh, if I use this parameter or this, um, is there a wrong choice? Well, basically, I think the only thing that can happen is that you don't create the smallest file or that it doesn't have error CRCs in there. But that's about it. We'll, we'll get into the details. But if you do it like with a lossy codec and you s choose a certain parameter set, that's it. You've made the decision, and it's irreversible. Not to be scared, but it's like it's... I'm way more stressed when I have to choose encoding parameters for lossy formats than for lossless formats, because I can always redo this. So what are these parameters for? Starting with <laughs> the most complicated ones that involve the math of compression. So one's called coder. Well, straightforward. One's a Gollum rice coder. The other one's a range coder. Um, and if you look it up on Wikipedia, so the blue ones are links, and you'll get a link to the slides. It's actually. Um, coding, not coder, because it's a mathematical way of compressing data that's completely reversible. So fancy speak for those are algorithms. I'll grab some water. Um, is this water? It is. <laughs> the cool thing is I will not explain how these algorithms work. I studied at university, I was amazed, I never really got my head deeply into them so far that I can actually say, okay, I can explain you how it works. But it's really cool to read it up. These algorithms are from the 70s. And that's what I found really cool about FFV1, is everyone was focusing on wavelet compression of JPEG 2000, and it's fancy and new and mathematically even more mind-blowing, dealing in the frequency space, but I'm, I'm derailing here. Basically, it's a clever way of applying old algorithms to audiovisual data. And what's important for you is you can choose between 0, 1, and 2. The first ones are the ones that are actively used. The last one is one that kind of could be used for some different results of compression ratio. but unless you're really tuning for one file, one material, um, my personal experience is choose either one and you're fine because for the vast majority of material, you can't really fine tune. So 
uh, for 8 bits per component, it's going to be Gollum Bryce or range. And for larger than 8 bits per component, you don't have to choose anyway because it's going to be range coder anyways. What Michael Niedermeyer told me is that the range coder should be able to adapt to changes in the content a bit faster and maybe possible to reduce smaller files. But he said, this is more like a gut feeling, and there's been no extensive benchmarking on this. The second option is context. It's how much context, like how far in time between frames and fields does the algorithm look and try to make estimations about what's going to happen because compression in a lossless way works of like trying to find patterns, trying to find stuff that where a change is minimal to the next so it can just store the change. It's something like that. So a large context mm, has to consider more, might be slower to adapt, might compress better. Long story short, it depends on the material you could fine tune, but there's no one golden rule. I haven't found that like it's always zero that produces smaller files, always one. It really depends on the material. So the first two things, layman's terms, you can just basically let go <laughs> which ones you choose, unless you're fine tuning for one material and want to squeeze like it to the smallest kind of space that you can get. In brackets, I mentioned which one's the default setting if you don't set it explicitly, but I'll get back to that. The more interesting one that we've introduced in FF1 after version one is slices. Before I read this, I'm going to jump here. This is what slices are. So your frame gets chopped up into parts. These parts can then be in parallel fed to encoding threads in the CPU, which enables the encoder to run in parallel. So when I picked up FFE1 in 20, 2009, uh, it was like it could only do a full frame or field, and there was no parallel processing. So we're always stuck with the performance that one CPU core gives you, and you couldn't scale beyond this. So then I was engaged in like, okay, let's make a multi-threaded version of FFE1, and Michael Niedermeyer introduced these slices to be able to spread these slices across the CPU cores. That's why it's only since FFE1 version greater or equal to that slices exist, and that's these versions of FFE1 can do multi-threading. So if you're into performance, then you will need slices. You will want slices, and you'll do multi-threading. Each slice has a small header, so it's got like each one of these slices has like, okay, that one's this slice, has some information with it. The more slices you choose, you get slightly bigger files. Like, oh my god, oh my god, dude, size. But it's like, no, 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 chill. Uh, the video con in itself is like way larger than the slice header overhead will be. But if you use more slices, you get larger files. I have to tell you. That's just an example for nine slices. You can choose not any, but different number of slices, depending on how many slices you want to chop your image up into. And I'm like, why would I want to do this? It's getting bigger. I don't have, like, why is he telling me this? Because there's another thing that we've added, which is called slice CRC. It's hash code or checksums, same, same, but different. It's uh, error detection code per slice. So having more slices means in the header, you have CRC code for each slice that says, oh, this slice decodes nicely, or this slice has some bitstream error. You might want to do something else with it because something's wrong. More slices now means more robust files. Because if something breaks in a part of a slice, you only have to deal with that part of an image. The smaller the slices, the smaller the impacted area. Now, CRCs are actually not for repairing errors. The first thing what they're here for is to tell you if it's OK or not. In previous versions of FFE1 before version 3, there was no slice CRC, so the decoder had to do like, I'm decoding, I'm decoding, I'm decoding. Oh my god, I crashed because the bitstream was broken, and I didn't know that there was a problem in it, so it just tried to decode possibly broken data, which could do anything to the decoder, depending on the decoder. So what happens now is the decoder can say, coming in, 
CRC, okay, decoding, okay, decoding. No, that's not okay. Now the decoder can decide because the decoder knows that field's not okay. I can now decide. It really depends on the decoder. There's no every time you decode a field with a broken slice CRC, this happens. No, you can say, well, show it to the archivist as it is, like that's the data, but I know it's broken, it's kind of, hmm. or you can say, well, you want to do error concealment? I give you the slice from the previous field. This is typical error concealment as, for example, as in the DV codec, because parts of the image very often resemble the ones from the previous frame. So you can make the stuff look nicer if you want to. There's even a possibility of doing brute force attempt of restoring the data until the CRC matches again. But depending on the size of the slice and number of the data, I'm not saying that you can fix errors, but you theoretically could depending on computing power. But it's for your safety, and as an archivist, I will want this to know if my stuff inside is still good. What else? I said FFE1 versions. So there's version zero. Sure, we programmers always start count with zero. Let's not waste a number. Then it's just that was the first version of FFE1. It could do stuff, single threading, and so on. Version one, which is the current default, by the way, if you don't explicitly choose another one, uh, it has information for like scan type. Uh, and number three, which is the one that's recommended, has all bells and whistles that we currently have, like multi-threading and slice CRCs. What about the scan type? I'm mentioning this because you have a video codec and you have a container. And sometimes you can store technical metadata inside the container, and sometimes you can't. So I've been using f one in AVI, and AVI has no field for storing uh, a scan type or stuff like this. So you can store it inside the video bitstream. That's a topic for a nice discussion, like what's better? Store that in the container, or the codec, or both, and what if they don't agree? But that's something else. Let's stick with the properties here. Now you know that F1 can store the field order. Just an example from the specs, uh, that's how it can store it. Like, I don't know, top field first, bottom field first, or progressive, or reserved for future use. Wrapping up the stuff about F1, the default values is the default version is version number one not version number three. So you have to explicitly say, please make an FFV 1.3 file. Coder, as I said, if you have eight bits per component, default is Gollum Rice Coder. And if you have more than eight bits per component, which is probably the default if you do analog ingest, you're gonna have range coder anyways. Context is small, as I said, works. Tweak with it if you're into it. Let me know if you have any benchmarking results. Slices are four, so your image is chopped up into four pieces. My personal favorite is 24 slices. I kind of found it nice that the number of slices div divides well by the CPU cores that I have, but that's just for encoding performance or decoding performance. If you have the file and then you decode it in a different CPU in the future that has, I don't know. So that's just a performance thing. It doesn't really it's not that important how many slices you choose for preservation, except with slice CRCs, because then your file's more robust. Getting to the Matryoshka container. Thanks, Steve, for helping me out there. So I'm only mentioning some of the parameters, because it's a very powerful container, and we will not even fit this in a three-day talk, what Matryoshka can do. It's fancy and it's cool. So I've picked those ones in case of you who are familiar with a media conch, the conformance checking tool, there's a policy that says, is Matryoshka well described? And I said, okay, these fields are reasonable. Let's take a look at what they are. So the first one is segment unique identifier. It's a randomly generated unique identifier that basically is just like a number in your file that's like you can use this number to really identify this file from another file. <clears throat> and by default, each file has one segment identifier. 
The other thing is a seek head. I would think of it like an index where a player can go like, okay, what's in your file? And he gets an information, what's in the file and where to find it. It's actually optional, but it speeds up the seeking process to like know which streams, what stuff's in there, and so on. It's like an index. You can just browse through the books, read it, but you would have to read through the whole file to know what's in there. <coughs> Matroshka also contains fixity, like the slice CRC in F31's bitstream for the slices. Out of video stream, Matroshka has CRC in its structure. So it knows if its technical structure and metadata is intact or not. Same principle, so it has these elements like metadata elements, structure elements, and so on, and it can go like, okay, you want to decode me? This one's okay, CRC is fine. This one's okay, CRC is fine. Oh, you're going there? Well, CRC is not fine, now you have to decide what you do with it. But it's always good if a decoder knows if it's getting valid data or invalid data. You also want to have this for preservation, and by default, it's on. It also stores the scan type um, in two fields. So one is, it says, is it interlaced or not? Like, I don't know, it's interlaced or it's progressive. And then there's a second one that says, okay, so progressive, progressive, or you have a top field first, or, well, it's interlaced, but I don't know, or you have a bottom field first, and then the other two, bottom field first swapped and top field first swapped, the way I understood it from reading it, I'm not 100% sure to admit it. It's like the data is stored in this way, but please present it in this way. He's nodding, I'm right. <laughs> now, I'm doing some crossover here for uh, practical reasons. So you've got the Mitraka container, the values in white, that's how they're in. Um, there's an, a really nice tool called Matroshka Prop Edit, or basically MKV Toolnix from Moritz Bunkus, and it's a very elaborate tool suite, cross-platform and everything, that you can use to fine-tune, tweak, and analyze Matroshka files. I basically find it, like here, down there, uh, I have Matroshka uh, Toolnix in the credits afterwards. So it's like, if you do an MKFA prop edit minus L, it lists all kind of properties of Matroshka that it's able to, that it knows about. And so the white terms are the terms of MKV prop edit. And this is the color information about the video data stored inside. So you have the color range, if it's full range or broadcast range. You've got primaries, transfer characteristics, and matrix coefficients for giving you your files, the metadata, how to treat the color right. And below there with the minus, those are the syntax parameters for if you make a file with FFmpeg and you want to provide this information. That's not Matroska specific. It's basically you tell FFmpeg this is the color information and it'll do its best and its job to translate this to whatever container you're actually using. So this will set the fields with color information to make the media conch policy happy if the Matroshka file is well defined. I took the actual values here, like the, like this. Oops. These ones are for PAL, and I just took them from the code of V record, because there are people who are better at explaining color stuff in video files than I am. More things in Matroshka. That one's like, yeah, everyone can do this tagging. Yes, yeah, descriptive metadata, but it's not to be taken for granted. Not all containers have an elaborate suite of tags that you can use. So you can tell the file, this audio track is English, this audio track is German, this audio track is Hungarian, or this video track is this, or this video track is that. And you can really do this in a very nice and not a hacked way. So it's really designed for this. Another one that shall be used with caution. With great power comes great responsibility. You can put files, any kind of file, in a Matroshka container. Hmm. 
Hmm. I'm very, quite emotional about this. So a lot of archivists go like, I want to have everything in one file. But I'm like, but it's way difficult to parse it and you have to make, like, the applications have to support, like, the more stuff you put in your file, the more complex your file is, the harder it is to migrate, read, because you have to deal with everything that's inside. I want to have everything in one file. And I'm like, okay, I know, but broadcast does it. I want to have everything in one file. And I'm like, yes, but have you ever dealt with a file that has more... Okay, I think, I hope you know what I'm getting at. It's like as simple as possible and as complicated as necessary is a very good approach for preservation. So you can put files into a Matryoshka container. It's really cool because that's what it even says on Matryoshka website. It's really cool. You can actually put the code to decode your stuff into Matryoshka file. I could just take the source code of FFmpeg and put it into my video file. It'll be 50 megabytes larger, but that'd be awesome. But then you need programs that actually know that there's an attachment in there and deal with it and so on. So for example, the ones of you who know raw cooked, it uses this to take all files that are not audiovisual and are also there like metadata files or XMLs or whatever you put next to your film DPX wave stuff and just puts it in a Matryoshka container like in a zip file. Um, I think you should notice, but again, choose wisely if and how you use this feature. A nice one would be like thumbnails or whatever. So wrapping up uh, with an FFmpeg recipe to give you something to go and play with, that would be a recipe for uh, creating PEL, a uh, European kind of file, FFE1 in Matryoshka. So what is it? We've got FFmpeg minus input video file source, codec video FF1, please choose version 3, coder 1, which is range coder, context 0, small context, slice is 24, it's also Christmas, and please enable CRCs for the slices. Why did I choose coder 1 and context 0, although these are the default values? because the default values in any application that you use might change over time for these or that reasons. And I prefer for encoding for archival stuff to explicitly say, I'm encoding with these parameters, so you're sure that this is the set that you're encoding with. Color primaries, color information, map zero says, please take all the streams from the source and map them to the target as good as possible. Um, then I define a top field first, so it's interlaced, and I want to have the information in there. Uh, copy the audio stream as it is, make a group of pictures of size one, intra frame only, and PIX format plus, it's regardless of codec and container, but it says the color information subsampling and the PIX format in FFmpeg. If you cannot use the same identical PIX format in the target as in the source, throw an error. Without this, FFmpeg would nicely, conveniently fall back to the nearest matching PIX format option. But as an archivist, I want to keep the original as it is and be sure about this. There are some reference in the slides that I also used for lookup and reference. Some of them are the specifications. Some of them are the Wikipedia pages. They're a nice read, especially like now it's winter. It's cold outside. You can read stuff. That's it for this morning. Uh, thank you very much. Questions or comments? Do we have, uh, we're going to take questions from the outside world uh, first. This is from the Collaborative Notes. It says, why doesn't Michael Niedemeyer make V3 the default given its clear benefits? Uh, why what? Uh, why is it? Why isn't uh, three the default in FFV1? I was asking myself the same question. <laughs> and I'm probably going to like speak with the others and go, like, if we could just change this to three, but I tried it with the current version in Git, then it's actually one. Unless I made a mistake, which also can happen. Anything else? Any other questions? Yep. Uh, yes? Uh, David Flugel, 
Did I get that correctly? You can put conflicting information on um, the field order in Matroshka and FFV1 in and what happens? Any if code you again container. If, for example, I have it with H264, where it's very common, it's in my notes in here that a lot of people produce the file and don't check what kind of metadata was set, if it ran this correctly. So sometimes an H. The code extreme, in that case, H264, it's nothing after one of a trash specific. Yes, they can disagree. Are you raising your hands? You, you want to you wanna answer this? Yes. Then go for it. <laughs> Hold on one second. Because there's not one solution to this. It's a choice, but I'm curious. Uh, Carlo Genoyos from FFmpeg. The problem is even uh, worse because you can you can tell your your codec that it should use interlaced encoding for progressive material. So then the codec will definitely store that that it's interlaced because you need that information for decoding. Uh, but uh, now what should we store in the container? Should we store the information that the original material was progressive, or should we store the information that we used interlaced encoding to, uh, to, store the inform to actually store the information? And to, to give it an, approx an, an additional level of complexity, if the original uh, content was broadcast, then it is always marked as interlaced, even if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's a movie, in which case it's, it's most likely not interlaced, but progressive material. So I understand the question, but there is no simple answer because of, of how, how interlaced works. This was one of the reasons that HEVC did not contain uh, any specification uh, for interlaced encoding, and we were extremely happy about it. But the broadcasting industry found a way to put interlaced to, in, to use interlaced encoding, which HEVC, which makes decoding nearly impossible. Thank you, Steve. Hold on, one more question. Now Here you know go. why I kind of shipped around this, because we can talk about that very long. Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, the problem in storing the information is th in the codec is that if you want to change it, you, you have to re-encode everything. The idea of storing it in the container is that you can fix something, like maybe not interlacing, but for example, the uh, transfer function or color range, you can change that if you realize that the source materials will, was lying about what it was actually using. You can fix it in the container, and the whole f file will play correctly. If you want to change it in the codec, then you will have to re-encode everything, and with the big storage and everything, it's probably a problem. That's why I'm a big fan of that the container overrides the codec one, so I can basically fix this because I have this, and with H.264 I'd have a generation loss if I fix it with re-encoding. I think I'm out of time, but the thing is that there's, it's tricky. Thank you very much.